So what we do on Let Us Explain is dive deep on a piece of movies or entertainment that we can't stop thinking about for other people who can't stop thinking about that thing too. That means we'll be talking about anything and everything. Sometimes that includes spoilers, but before we dive into bad education spoilers, let's talk more generally about this new movie. I am your co-host Zachary Shevich, joined by Arturo Zarita and the director of Bad Education, Corey Finley. Corey, thank you so much for being here with us. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for having me. For sure. We're really excited to have the director of a, a really cool movie uh, here on Intercut. We don't normally get this opportunity, so we're, we're taking advantage of it. Uh, Going to get deep into some talk on bad education. But uh, first, I wanted to talk to you about uh, your background a little bit, because you were a playwright, and your last th- film, Thoroughbreds, uh, was adapted from a play you wrote, and you wrote the screenplay for that as well. Uh, so I'm curious about what influenced you uh, to direct something that you didn't write for this film? Yeah, it's a great question. It's been an, an interesting roundabout journey to this point. Um, like you said, I started playwriting, uh, moved to New York right after college, and um, it happened to be SAT tutoring at the time to pay the bills, which actually surprisingly kind of inspired parts of both films, which we can get into. But uh, nice. while, while tutoring, I was, I was uh, writing plays and eagerly putting them up in whatever, you know, little tiny basement space in uh, Manhattan or Brooklyn I could possibly find and kind of con friends into joining me to do and uh, had a ton of fun doing that. As I got deeper into it, I realized that I really did love, um, you know, elements outside the writing. I really loved like getting kind of nitty gritty about even the sound design of plays and how we would, you know, make the audience experience. Um, sort of beyond just a standard proscenium stage and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, was lucky to work with some awesome theater directors, but also was really excited to um, to take on more of that role uh, that involves kind of bringing the many pieces of a production together. And then I'd written Thoroughbreds fully intending it to do, to do it as a play, um, mm-hmm. but just uh, sort of similarly as I was sitting with it, like realized that it, it had Uh, potential as a movie that there were things I could do with that story with those characters um, that would uh, be sort of better explored in film than uh, than on the stage so I um, was lucky to connect up with some producers and and then Olivia Cook and Annie Taylor Joy and the rest of that team and um, had a blast making that movie just loved the directing part of it Um, the you know obviously wrote and directed that one but the everything from casting to uh, really working with my DP, Lyle Vincent, to think about camera movement. Um, I love the editorial process. I work with an amazing editor named Louise Ford, um, and that's become just one of the real critical um, elements of the, of the storytelling process for me. And so as I was thinking about a second feature, I just happened to read the script that I really loved um, by a writer named Mike Mikowski. He's the screenwriter of Bad Education, and he actually went to the high school uh, where the true life story takes place. So he has okay. a kind of amazing, you know, personal experience and authority over this story and over the setting and um, started talking with him. And I think it helped that I had come out of writing uh, as far as just being able to have a good open back and forth between a writer and a director and, uh, and loved it. So I still continue to want to write. I think I'll always write, um, but it was really eye opening and cool to see how uh, fulfilling this experience could be sort of taking the, the director's chair instead. A little follow-up there. You said the writer went to the school. He didn't go to the school to write it. He went to the school while it was happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be, be grammatically clear. He didn't visit Whoa. the school. He was, a, he was in middle school when, this, when the events of the film took place. Uh, wow. So he, he, and he's a, a fascinating guy to talk to. He briefly met Frank Sassone, but more importantly, he just really... Um, he really, I mean, he knows the, he knows the culture, he knows the, the town, um, and I think this story has been like kind of a local legend, um, not a legend, but, but a, a really important story locally um, since then, and has, has kind of shaped his whole childhood, and, and, um, and so it was, it was an awesome experience for him to write it, and it was really cool working with him to kind of recreate or create a new version of um, these mm-hmm. events. Right. Yeah, I mean, it has some of those lived-in feelings, whether it's the little period details, because the movie takes place in 2002. Uh, you know, I got some nostalgia from the flip yeah. phone. Or uh, the Long Island accents, which are 
excellent in this movie. Uh, shout out to Alice and Jenny, who's really, really excellent. Uh, but I did want to ask, because both your last movie and this one kind of deal with this sort of idyllic suburban setting and maybe some of the more nefarious intentions that are, are lurking beneath the surface. Is that a through line that you see with your work, at least thus far? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a through line with these two movies. Um, I, my, my plays, uh, the, you know, the other things I've written don't all sort of exist in that world, and I've been, I've been doing some other writing in slightly different worlds, but that's a world I know, know pretty, pretty well, not specifically Long Island, but I grew up in um, St. Louis, Missouri, in uh, sort of a, a really nice, lovely suburb of St. Louis. Um, but then also had have, have had experiences both through the, the tutoring that I was talking about um, and even just with kind of friends from college and, and um, being introduced to different worlds of, of feeling like sort of an, an outsider in uh, mm. even more privileged, uh, even more wealthy environments. Uh, and, you know, anywhere from sort of having many friends go into investment banking and that sort of world. And um, it's always been, you know, I think the the sort of the the problems of wealth the um the the like obviously the sort of invisible violence of wealth the way that wealth is yeah. power in in today uh is is always um a really fertile theme for me and something that i that i love to explore for sure totally. you hit it well uh so we talked we briefly mentioned that the writer of this film was in middle school when this whole uh scandal was occurring uh, so he's obviously got a, a connection to this story, uh, and it is based in reality. But I was wondering how much the truth actually mattered to you uh, when you were making this into a movie, because obviously, the adaptation pro with the adaptation process comes some embellishment and some uh, changing of elements. Mm -hmm. Art artistic license, as we say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's definitely a balance, and it's something we we thought about. I use the royal we to mean you know me and Mike and our producers and Hugh and and. The, the, the ever expanding team of a film, we talked a lot about um, I exactly that question and how much we had kind of a duty to be true to the story uh, versus how much we could, you know, condense. There's a fair amount of condensing of time in the story. There's some composite characters, as we like to say. Um, mm. But we really, we did want to stay true to the essence of the story and to the elements of it that kind of thematically made it so rich and interesting for me. Um, and some of the contradictions of Frank's character, some of the ways in which his, you know, individual crimes, individual mistakes um, were related to some of the larger systems, um, educationally and, and economically mm -hmm. speaking. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't have a, a simple answer to that question, but I just say it's, I think it's, it's incumbent upon anyone making a true story into a at least partly fictionalized film to take that question seriously and find the right answer for for the individual project. Totally. Uh, in, in my researching of this, I, I found a lot of plot points that were uh, basically copied exactly for they for what they were, including like the the sixty cent bagel that got written about in the New York Times. Uh, it, were there any ma major plot points that were made up, or on the co on the contrary, were there any plot points that you almost you felt like yeah. would be made up, mm, but were actually yeah. truth? Well, definitely some of the latter kind, for sure, there were. And, and we did try to be really specific about, um, you know, the, the sort of the scandal itself. And this is sort of spoiler territory, I suppose. But the, um, the amounts of money that were stolen, the, the way that some of the embezzlement happened, um, you know, some of the most kind of dramatic, like, like movie-feeling parts of the movie, I think, are ripped from real life. Um, and of course, you you know you have to do a certain amount of imagination. Like you you can't. We were not in the rooms, we, and, and you know there would be there would be no purpose in making this film rather than a documentary if we could reconstruct exactly how everything had happened. Um, totally. There's certainly some kind of you know speculation and um, fleshing out around um, around a number of parts of the story. But you know, like one of the things is the the Rachel character is is what we call a composite character, the the mm -hmm. student newspaper um, at Roslyn High School, the Hilltop Beacon, did play a pretty critical role in um, in bringing this scandal to light. It, it I would encourage anyone that finds the movie interesting to go read about how exactly it happened. It was okay. there were differences, but it's an incredibly strange, fascinating story. Um, there was some stuff that we shot and ended up 
pulling out of the movie that did happen in real life uh, involving an anonymous letter. Uh, I'll just I'll just say that and encourage Ooh. anyone to read about it. But um, but generally, particularly with the real, you kind of have to do more speculation about the like the personal lives of characters. That's mm -hmm. not as much on the record. But mm -hmm. anywhere we could use stuff where there is a firm historical record, we we tried to use it. Right. Yeah. Uh, Hugh's character Frank goes through a lot of emotions just through the duration of the of the film and uh, his feelings as he's sort of guarding these these, these various secrets. You can tell. Uh, he, there's a lot of internal thought and external uh, ma masking of those thoughts, too. Uh, how closely did you work with Hugh to kind of get that exact type of performance? Yeah, well, Hugh did a ton of preparation on his own, more than probably any other actor I've, I've worked with. Just really, and that's, I think, always a part of his process. Um, mm -hmm. He often uh, just really reads up, you know, both, both about kind of the... Um, the scandal itself and the specifics and everything we do have on the historical record. And then other stuff that I wouldn't think of as a director that just really helps him inhabit the character. So he spent some time speaking to current superintendents of school systems um, and heads of school and uh, kind of understanding just what, you know, what skills, what personality traits um, people in that particular position need to succeed and what their stresses are, what their, you know, just little pieces of, of like lived in truth that he can bring to the character. And so we, we talked a lot um, beforehand. He had a lot of input on the script. Um, he had a lot of thoughts, uh, you know, about how particular moments would play out, but also he did an enormous amount of preparation himself. I think everyone knows that about Hugh when he's doing like a role that involves like dancing, for example. He, he does a ton yeah. of preparation on, on the physical side of things or preparing yeah. his body to be Wolverine. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you had to coach him on being, being a reluctant dancer for that one scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked a little bit about it. I mean, he's, very, he's a very good reluctant dancer. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, um, and he, uh, but yeah, he does, I think, just as much effort. He puts just yeah. as much effort into a character without Easily. those kind of obvious physical aspects as he does yeah. into like... I, wor I worked at a school, so he talked exactly how <laughs> superintendents intend to talk on people when they want him to get what needs to be done. So that was perfect. Where did you, what, what sort of uh, setting did you work in? I'm curious. Uh, so I was working with a lot of like bilingual students before I got into a lot of the filmmaking stuff. So I knew like when superintendents needed something to get done. When he said the real estate line, that was so real in manipulating people to be like, hey, the school's got to be the way it is or else the real estate's going to hurt. And then everybody else, as I know we get a little bit more into spoilers, started going like, well, I guess we're all in this together unless we want it to go downhill. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it really is like that. <laughs> it really is like that. Yeah, that's amazing. I have a, a brother that works in, um, that teaches history in high school um, in Providence. And then I have a, um, a mother that actually runs a, a all girls school, private all girls school in Pittsburgh. So I have a lot wow. of educators wow. in the family as well. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's an underappreciated position for sure. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Did they give you any uh, additional insight too? Uh, yeah, I mean, I talk to, you know, uh, whether I want to or not, they're both very uh, talkative. And every Thanksgiving, we talk a lot about, like, education reform and policy and best practices. And uh, they're both just two of the smartest people that I know. And, um, yeah, and I did talk to them a little bit specifically about this film and, and just continuing to get to context. But, um, yeah. Yeah. but uh, a lot of it was just, you know, picked up by osmosis around the family table. Uh, I don't know how uh, – I do want to get into spoilers in a moment, but I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, path that the film is taking before we get there uh, because I don't know how directly involved you were in this, but I'm curious uh, what some of the thinking was in taking this film, which premiered uh, at the Toronto International Film Festival, and ultimately uh, landing on HBO yeah. as opposed to your previous movie uh, ended up having a theatrical run. What, what's that difference like for you as a filmmaker? Yeah, well, they were both – financed in, in similar models where we had an independent financier. It's sort of the, you know, the old school indie film model, um, which I love and which has produced so many phenomenal movies and is, is I think, becoming less and less common. Um, but we were fortunate yeah. that, yeah, both films were independently financed. Both films we took to festivals to sell. Um, and Focus Features distributed Thoroughbreds, and that was awesome. And, um, and yeah, I think we, like, really lucked out with HBO. Obviously, there's there's nothing at all positive about uh, this quarantine and, and it's truly a, a stressful and kind of tragic time in America uh, and in the world but um, mm -hmm. but it is it is great that this is able to 
you know, come out in a really organized and and sort of massive way on the small screen, and that that uh, hopefully will be some some much needed uh, new content to use a cynical yep. term for people. Absolutely. Um, yeah, a lot of movies are uh, are in limbo right now, and you've you have the fortune of actually found... getting to exhibit your your new work. Exactly. Be like the big release of the week. We always follow the box offices. We were excited to see a small movie like Swallow was the top box office for the last two weeks. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. now, yeah, now having bad education, hopefully a lot more people are hopping on that HBO and realizing, you know, hey, cinema's still here. It's just in the comfort of your own home now. Definitely, definitely. And I do think this is a movie that will uh, like hold up well in that format. I love easily. Um, I love theatrical uh, exhibition as well. I certainly hope that that industry comes roaring back after this yes. is over. Um, you know, even coming from theater, I love that live experience. But mm -hmm. something about this movie and the way that we try to have the story sort of unfold, I think it'll be a really fun movie for people to experience. Um, you know, in their in their homes. Yeah, totally. So I have a very interesting perspective that I'm curious to hear from you because, like you said, you've done plays. You've done movies theatrically, and now you're doing it through the streaming model. I don't know if you have uh, TV in your future, but how is every single platform or every single medium, uh, do you prefer one over the other? Do you see big differences, changes that are coming from them? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think everyone in the in the industry, uh, another cynical term, the industry, <laughs> is, yeah. uh, is thinking about that. And, um, you know, I, like obviously, uh, TV and TV and 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 films that premiere in this way, like, and streaming, all of these, um, uh, all of these have changed so fast in the last couple of years. Yeah. It's been kind of head spinning, and um, I think uh, you know there there are just trade offs between the different models. And I'm I'm sort of early in this journey with uh, with HBO, but it's been phenomenal, and they uh, you know are really one of the kind of like legacy. Uh, prestige companies of, mm -hmm. of the, the small screen TV streaming world. And, um, and so we've been really lucky to work with them. Um, you know, love, love theatrical distribution too. I think there are, you know, lots of, lots of companies finding sort of innovative ways to keep films in theaters and, and obviously even films that, that, uh, that have a run in theaters end up having a life, um, extended life in, good, in yeah. streaming and TV and, and all of that. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's going to come in the next couple of years, but uh, the encouraging thing has been that um, I think maybe more than in previous eras, there is a real, um, I, I think people working in all those media have a real love of like complex, thoughtful storytelling. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's awesome. And I don't think that's going to go anywhere. I think the, the uh, formats will continue to shift. Absolutely. Oh. So uh, we do want to dive into the spoilers. So if you're afraid of the truth, can't handle the truth, or just want to wait until you've seen Bad, Ed Bad Education, head over to HBO, watch the movie, and come right back. Uh, so we have some more stuff we want to get into uh, with Corey here. So uh, first of all, I wanted to ask about uh, sort of what we were talking about earlier, this, this shared complicity uh, that, that we see developed throughout the movie, uh, the, the way in which... Uh, this scandal seemingly uh, happened because everybody was getting uh, getting a piece of it. Uh, how how did you were, was it difficult to try and illustrate the ways in which it sort of became this corrupting influence? Was that there already in Mar in, in Mike's script? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad you picked up on that um, because. I, you know, I wanted this to be a movie with no single villain. I think obviously some people will see Frank as a villain. Um, you know, he is, he's a, he was a convicted criminal, but I, I, I see a lot to, to be sympathetic about in that character. I see, um, you know, I think we've all uh, had moments where we realize we can get away with something simple and victimless and we, and we do it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this just happened on a really large scale in this movie, in this story. And, um, and, and yeah, and, and I also don't want to say that, you know, I, I certainly don't think that Roslyn is like a uniquely uh, corrupt town or anything like that. I think it's a wonderful place. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, still has an incredible school system. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we wanted to take this really specific story and use it to, um, to say something about sort of the, the systems that, incur that incentivize us all to do bad things. And... Um, 
one of the really interesting specific ways that happens in education is just through this weird uh, kind of circular relationship between property values and public schools, which is not a, mm-hmm. not a thing a ton of people think about uh, unless they uh, are choosing yeah. where to send their kids to public school. <laughs> uh, because education has always been one of the great like way, uh, means of, of generational wealth uh, mm-hmm. dist- you know, uh, conti- keeping your, your line going sort of by investing in your kids' education. And you can obviously do that through private schools, but even in public schools in so many, specifically American public schools, part of the, a big part of the school's income comes from the property values of the suburb that it serves. And that in turn increases the property values of the suburbs. And so a place like Roslyn, and there are many, many places like that, I kind of grew up in one in St. Louis, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you get this relationship, this, this um, sort of circular income inequality relationship between the schools and the wealth of the community. Um, and Mike's script from the very first draft really, really pointed that out. Um, in a smart and subtle way. And uh, we wanted it to be a thread running through the movie. Yeah, we see that Mm -hmm. even when uh, some of the the, uh, embezzlement is caught at first, uh, even though some people have that impulse to go tell the police, go, uh, you know, uh, essentially uncover the situation, uh, ultimately they see how they're benefited by not making it into a bigger deal. Uh, and in that way, you know, everybody is mutually benefiting from mm-hmm. what w- was uh, a gigantic scandal. Um, yeah. And I, th- I think your movie does a great job of, uh, you know, illustrating that without necessarily getting super explicit about it. Yeah. Um, Even with Thoroughbreds, I remember uh, I had read an interview with you where you, I think one of the things that really gravitates me towards your projects is that you never, like you said, someone isn't an outright villain. Mm-hmm. They're doing something for a reason. And it's like when you have characters like that on screen, like I said, what I left coming out with wasn't, oh, that person's bad, that person's good. It's like, I remember the stuff that they're talking about, about the infrastructure. I, I, and I hope that when people finish watching this movie, when people watch films like Thoroughbred and everything else that you have uh, coming forward, uh, that idea of having characters that are multifaceted, because we're so used to someone either being good or bad, and you don't get that in between to really talk about the stuff you should be talking about. Totally. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's a good, uh, what was it? Was it Roger Ebert that called movies like empathy machines? Yeah. Yes. Probably butchering that quote, but it's an amazing. That's that's exactly exactly right. Yeah. And I love like, you know, training that empathy machine on uh, characters that seem very difficult to love. Um, Mm. Because, you know, the two, the two sort of murderous teens and thoroughbreds and and this this very complex character Frank Tassone. Like I, I love those characters and I and I think the actors playing them especially have to love them to do a good mm-hmm, job mm-hmm. of or at least understand mm-hmm. them to do a good job of playing them. And um, and yeah, like when, when movies I think a, a good, like challenging movie will will uh, ask you to see the bad things that someone does and still uh, try to extend them your sympathy. And yeah. agreed. And yeah, and then the blame, if, if, it, if, it, if the blame can't simply fall squarely on an individual and end there, it has to go to the systems, which yes, I think sir. is a good, a totally. good way for, yes, for sir. hopefully, you know, American politics is starting to understand that as well. <laughs> but, uh, right, right. but yeah. A reflection of, uh, of much larger systems, if you will. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I do think there's a great, jo- there's a great uh, scene in which uh, Hugh's character, Frank, talks about how he, he meant to fix the problem by Monday, and then Monday comes, comes and gone, and uh, it, it sort of becomes this sort of uh, microcosm of how he can continue to get away with all these, thing, uh, all these things that his character does, uh, and just the lack of accountability or oversight, uh, which ultimately led to so many of these problems. Totally, totally. And, and you know, I think it's... Um these are these are multifaceted problems, and certainly, like there's a, there's an economic incentive to um, for for people in the community to look the other way and not to not mm-hmm. to you know it's also I think an indictment of just like organizational uh, chaos that <laughs> like it's very easy for a, a big bureaucracy to uh, for things to fall through the cracks to slip through the cracks, and I think you know you need bureaucracy, <laughs> but uh, in a lot of places, but it's um, we wanted to have this sort of multifactorial explanation of the things that might have uh, fed into this scandal and this crime. Right. Nice. 
Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the final sequence of the movie. You do this really interesting kind of mirrored image uh, where he, you, we open the movie sort of seeing Frank manicuring himself in the mirror, and then we return to him in prison, also applying makeup to his face, and uh, then we go back down the hallway with him, uh, and he's returned to the school. Uh, what did you want to accomplish with that? No, why, did we, why did you want to return to that scene in particular? Yeah, that that ending. Well, the beginning because the ending mirrors the beginning, and the, and yes. the beginning was there from the very beginning. <laughs> the ending <laughs> we, was one of the last things that took that form, that final shape um, in the script. And we tried a lot of different things because it's a it's a tough story to know exactly how to end. You want it mm -hmm. to have the right degree of ambiguity, and and we felt we really wanted to end it on a sort of a, an emotional beat for Frank. And part of the thinking was. You know, um, we talked a lot about like what what is the core relationship of this movie? Is it the one between Frank and Pam, um, Alice Janney's character? Is it the one between Frank and Rachel, Geraldine Viswanathan's character, the sort of student journalist that we're in spoiler section, so so like brings him <laughs> down, uh, plays a role in bringing him down. Um, and ultimately, I I decided it was this was it was about sort of the relationship between Frank and the crowd sort of like Frank and almost like the gaze of the crowd, um, mm -hmm. the G-A-Z-E of the crowd. People, uh, you know, and so we, we begin and end with this moment of sort of a giant group of people, um, sort of faceless people, his, his, uh, yeah. his constituency, if you think of him as a politician, staring at him. And, um, you know, a lot of what I, I think, identified with about this character was this, you know, that he had this enormous drive to succeed, that he had this real... Um, real desire to help people that I don't think was just like an instrumental desire. I think you really did. And also a, um, you know, a real concern about how he was perceived. Um, and so just seeing that sort of crowd staring at him at the end felt like this just very, re very simple visual um, way to start and end with that relationship. And mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, at the beginning, we're, we're in this long steady cam shot where we're following him from behind. And then at the end, we're, it's, it's like an extreme close up that sort of sticks right up right in front of his face the whole time. And, you know, we wanted to sort of implicitly frame this idea that this was this movie was all about kind of getting to know this guy who we're, we're close on at the beginning, but still, uh, we, you know, still can't see him. He's still sort of hidden from view. And then at the end, we're right there with him. And we've learned a lot about him, but there are also things about him that we wanted to remain inscrutable and mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that ending that, that put the audience in similar versions of the same scene, but with them in a very different perspective felt like a way to accomplish that. And then, you know, it was just a cool, like, little movie magic dream sequence, having him walk out of the jail uh, into the school. I always have fun with that kind of thing. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that uh, expression of his that turns from kind of, like, frightened and overwhelmed to maybe great gratitude full of gratitude mm -hmm. and kind of uh, feeling of accomplishment it's kind of haunting in its own way uh given the other uh element going on is that in the beginning of the movie they were celebrating being number four and at the end of the movie you have that uh number one in in the background behind him uh it, it, it sort of I, I feel like it does a really interesting job of uh playing off this idea of appearances. They're, they are trying to uh, illustrate something about themselves and, and claim some sort of status, and uh, in, in a way they found a new one uh, through their actions. So uh, I thought that was just a very, very, very effective ending in uh, getting that type of feeling across. Oh, good, yeah, and all, you know, all credit to the ending working should go to Mr. Hugh Jackman because it, we have, we are, you know, there's a nice shot of the crowd from behind his back, but it's, we really did want to like hang the end of the way, the end of the movie, the weight of that yeah. on his performance in an extreme close up, mm -hmm. and and yeah, just give him a chance to really uh, feel things, and it, you know, it's cool because he is such a natural performer, and. Um, you know, he, he just did like a arena tour doing sort of song <laughs> yeah. and dance stuff. And he's just an incredible like like a right. showman. And um, he, you know, it was it was great that we were able to have that full crowd. Um, there's a little bit of VFX magic, but we you know, that was our biggest crowd day. Uh, and he was able to feed off that energy and that applause. And um, and yeah, it was it was it was definitely my favorite day of shooting was the beginning and ending. 
Did nope. you feel like the job and the cycle of uh, raising money and hiding it uh, was itself a bit of a prison for Frank? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think there's, what is it? I, I, I feel like I'm cribbing this from some kind of book or something, but I feel like there's a, um, maybe this was something Hugh had read as part of his research that he brought up, but there's often on people that are, that are hiding something that know that they could be busted for something. There's a strange form of relief in finally being figured out, um, in just sort of the worst thing actually finally happening. Um, and certainly in my own small ways, I've experienced that like the feeling of that sort of Damocles is much worse than, and you know, just having to wake up in the middle of the night and worry about what's going to happen to you is much worse than the thing actually, uh, happening. happening so, so yeah, I mean, I think the, one of the ways we wanted to have you really feel for Frank is, is, to lock into that human emotion of just that dread that sort of things beyond your control, maybe mistakes you've made are going to catch up with you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's a very, it's a very human emotion and a very, you know, cinematic one. Totally. Appreciate it. Uh, we did want to ask if you're working on anything else. I mean, obviously this is a, this is a weird time and, uh, productions have yeah. largely ground to a halt, but, uh, you're a writer, as you've mentioned, and uh, apparently there are some uh, deals being done. Do you have anything on the horizon? Uh, nothing that I can talk about yet to give that boring <laughs> answer. Um, I definitely am I'm working on writing some stuff. Um, I have a, a couple of projects that I'm very stoked about, but but yeah, certainly not shooting anything in the in the near future, um, which is probably a blessing. And um, and yeah, I mean, I sort of long term, I definitely want to continue doing stories that. Um, that are that are really grounded in character and that that have you know mixes of tones i always talk about thoroughbreds as like sort of a dark comedy slash psychological thriller yeah. and this is mm -hmm. is i see it as sort of a dark comedy slash tragedy almost like a greek tragedy and um and uh and those genre mixes are, are always something i'm really interested in and interested in in the big screen and the small one and you know hope to be able to tell you more in the future for sure exciting exciting uh, so we also wanted to know, uh, we ask all our guests when they come on the show, what they've been watching. Have you been uh, keeping busy with any new movies or just re revisiting some older ones? Yeah, I've been, um, one of my insecurities is as my, like my cinephile credentials because I, I love movies and I try to watch a lot of movies. But, you know, I spent years really being like a theater guy and I feel like mm -hmm. I have some some great, you know, knowledge of like 1960s British playwriting, but uh, don't have as deep a knowledge of film as some people do. So I've been going back and filling in some holes. Um, I watched uh, Belle de Jour, the Bunel film. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. really, really interesting Bunuel? movie. Bunuel, that sounds more correct. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about with my cinephile credentials. <laughs> I can't pronounce anyone. Your greatest fear is coming to fruition. Truly, uh, and some uh, some Antonioni. I watched uh, Red Desert, which was awesome. It was like the nice, last nice. public thing I did before the quarantine started. Was <laughs> see Red Desert at the Metrograph, and then I saw Blow Up at home, and love the way that he he sh shoots. Just beautiful, beautiful movies. Yeah, Blow Up is beautiful. Yeah, cool. amazing color palette, and, and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just gorgeous. Um, and yeah, and then you know. Um, Catching up on Succession finally, which is amazing. Yes. Yes. So, that's what I keep telling him to watch. He keeps telling me, he's like, just <laughs> stay at home and watch that. It's great. Have you watched any of it? I've seen the first couple of episodes and I was like, oh, this is one I need to pay attention to and not do anything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets better and better. It really is yes. like an yeah. accelerating uh, kind of show. It's brilliant. That was dope. All right. Awesome. Oh, and well, the last they, dance, the last dance, oh, because we got right. to we and then we got to dance. Before, yeah. Oh, what are you thinking of it so far? Because I think there's two episodes out. There's yeah. two episodes yeah. out now. I've only seen. I'm saving them. I'm like pacing them out because I'm mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. such what a basketball fan. What I always fan. tell Zach, you got to save them. You got you got to like eat them all at once. You got to binge them like that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should wait for them all to come out and then binge in one day. And then but, just go all through. There you go. But, but no, my my usual like part of why I haven't watched as many movies as I should is I watch way more. NBA basketball than I should, and that's been taken <laughs> away from me. So I'm, uh, I'm enjoying the last yeah. dance quite a bit. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I know one of the last things that I wanted to ask you was, I'm hoping, I'm not sure if it's possible, you had mentioned some clips that weren't, uh, it's, it's interesting with this new streaming era, how your extra features come out if there's no 
I don't know, maybe a Blu-ray, a DVD, <laughs> maybe HBO will have stuff like that. But I'm hoping that any of the extra, you know, content that you shot for the film makes its way out there, be it through commentaries or something else. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, that's any... such a good point. Yeah, I should figure out what we're gonna what we're gonna do with that because there is, you yeah. know, as always, there's quite a bit we left. It's my favorite room. part about rewatching films is uh, seeing all the making of of it. So hopefully, hopefully, you get an opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah it's a great point. All right, so I think that's about all we've got on this edition of Let Us Explain. Uh, Corey, did you want to leave us with any final thoughts on Bad Education? Uh, I don't think so. I just hope people, you know, watch it from the comfort of their own homes and stay there and and wear masks when they're outside (laughs) and all the good uh, Anthony Fauci recommendations. But uh, no, thank you guys so much for having me. This has been a real pleasure. Appreciate you. Thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify, whatever your favorite podcatcher is. And then make sure you're subscribed not just to the audio podcast, but to the video feed as well on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash intercutpod, where you can catch our bright, smiling faces as we run through the latest in entertainment. Find new episodes of Intercut every Friday. And please leave us a comment, like the video, and consider heading over to iTunes to give us a five-star review. Like our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. All of them are at intercutpod to get updates throughout the week from art and from me thanks again for tuning in and until next time accelerate